Hi, thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today, we wrap up our Limitless series with a message of celebration based on Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 9 through 12. The Life Notes can be downloaded now from calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. Hey, I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to take your Bible and turn to the book of Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah 8 is our text today, and if you don't have a Bible with you and uh, you're at one of our campuses, there's one around you here at Sweetwater. Uh, there are Bibles in the seats around you. Grab one of those Bibles. Uh, if you're at our Parker campus, there are Bibles at the back of the room, uh, you know, for a few more weeks anyway until you're in your new building, and then they'll be in the seats around you. And uh, go back there right now and grab one of those Bibles. Turn to page 475. 475, you'll be able to follow along with us in Nehemiah chapter 8. And as always, if you're at any of our campuses and you need a Bible, take one. We want you to have God's Word, read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, ask for us uh, and we will get you a Bible because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, it is only fitting that we're talking about celebration this weekend, and, uh, and I, because right now I'm celebrating, but it's uh, different than, than what I was planning on or what I'm preaching on, because uh, just a few minutes ago, I got to see uh, Lexi Magdaleno walk into our service. And since, uh, you know, a little over two and a half months ago, they weren't sure that she would live, much less walk. Uh, it, we just praise God for that miracle, even though we're still grieving the fact that it's one miracle less than we wanted. And so, uh, Parker, just know that uh, uh, she's here worshiping with us, appreciating your prayers, uh, as well as those of uh, the people around her right now. So, praise God. So, speaking of celebrations, what was your most memorable celebration? Hmm. Was it a uh, was it a wedding, first or second time? <laughs> was was it uh, was it an anniversary celebration or maybe a birthday? All right? How many of you have ever had a surprise birthday party thrown for you? <laughs> There's not a lot of hands going up. How many of you wanted one and haven't gotten one? <laughs> All right? S spouses take note. Our families take note. Uh, <laughs> how many of you never want one? <laughs> All right, families take note. Uh, so anyway, what'd you celebrate? Was it the birth of a child or a grandchild? Was it a graduation or a promotion or maybe a team victory or maybe your favorite team won the Super Bowl? I wouldn't know about that. I'm a Cardinals fan. Uh, but uh, today we are actually concluding our Limitless series talking about celebration. And, and see, Nehemiah had rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. The city was secure. It was prospering. Nehemiah had established justice for the community. He had modeled integrity and generosity, and he had even survived multiple assassination attempts. And so it was time to celebrate. So they called all the people to gather in Jerusalem, not just the people living in Jerusalem, because there weren't that many because they didn't have walls. Now they have walls. They called all the people from around into Jerusalem, and the people celebrated God's goodness. People celebrated God's goodness. I want us to, to read a piece of that there, beginning in just verse 9 of chapter 8. Chapter 8 is the whole the description of celebration. But it said, And Nehemiah, who was the governor and Ezra the priest and scribe and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. Be quiet, because they were wailing as, as they were mourning. And, uh, and all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. So the people celebrated God's goodness. Now, Nehemiah not only rebuilt the walls, 
but he rebuilt their justice system. I mean, it was just rife with corruption. And so he put people in charge that would be honest and fair. He promoted obedience to God's word. He, he closed the gates on the Sabbath because people were doing business on the Sabbath. And he said, this isn't right. We're not gonna do this. This is why you got punished before. And so he, he encouraged them to follow the law. And so uh, to celebrate the completion of the walls, he brought all the people together and they read the law. That's what the first part of chapter eight is about. And, uh, and then they celebrated in worship. The people celebrated in worship. Nehemiah 8, 6, just up a few verses earlier, it said, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, amen and amen, lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They worshiped the Lord. Why? Because they heard the truth of God's word. They understood it. And, and they were celebrating the fact that God had provided in amazing ways. See, worship is a natural response to God's goodness and grace. I mean, we want to praise the God who, who has created us, who loves us, and who has redeemed us through Jesus Christ. The people of Nehemiah were, were no different. I mean, they saw God's miraculous provision in the walls of Jerusalem and worshiped out of gratitude and praise. So they, were, they celebrated in worship and they celebrated through grief. Uh, Nehemiah 8, 9, I read this just a moment ago and, and I'm gonna read it again. Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe uh, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Uh, the people grieved as they heard the word of God and they recognized their sin and their failure to follow God. I mean, they had stood for hours as the law was read and, and that law pierced them their hearts because they went, wow, we disobeyed that, we disobeyed that, we've done this wrong, we haven't been following God. And so they were, they were grieved. And and what's interesting is they were admonished not to mourn because they were gathered there to celebrate what God had done. They go, this day is dedicated to God. It's not, it's not a day for you to weep and wail and mourn because you've been faithless. We're here to celebrate God's faithfulness. Isn't that interesting? You see, they celebrated through their grief. Now, grief is part of our lives. I mean, we live in a broken world and, be, and it's broken because of our sin. I mean, not just yours and mine, but you know, our ancestors started it. We just followed in their footsteps and so we're complicit in the sin of this world. But grief is part of our lives and so we grieve our sin. By the way, when you grieve your sin, it leads to confession and repentance, which results in grace. It results in God's grace being poured out into our lives because if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. If you wanna get to the place of, of celebration, you gotta start with grief anyway because you gotta say, hey, I'm a sinner, God, I need you to forgive me. And then we grieve the sin and self-destruction of others because we look around and we see the pain and we see, the, uh, we, we see our loved ones you know, being idiots and it hurts. And we grieve that. And we grieve the condition of people who don't know about Jesus, who are living without hope. Uh, you know, I don't know if it breaks your heart when you talk to somebody and they have absolutely no understanding of the love of God. You know, they're not even sure that God exists and you just see the pain and the hopelessness there. And then we grieve the loss of loved ones. Even knowing that in Christ we will see them again, we still are gonna carry that sorrow in our hearts. So we... That's the reality of grief, but still we celebrate. And we celebrate because Jesus has broken the power of sin and the power of death and the power of hell. And Jesus has set us free through his death and resurrection to live for him, to love like him, and to lead other people to him. And now we have hope even in our grief. And so we can celebrate the victory of Jesus. So they celebrated through grief and they celebrated through opposition. They celebrated through opposition. Nehemiah was opposed every single step of the way in his journey. I mean, uh, these, there were these two guys, Sanballat and Tobiah. They were not Jewish, but uh, they profited from the weakness of Jerusalem, and they were opposed to Nehemiah rebuilding the walls and creating a stability for the people of Jerusalem. So they tried to sabotage the work. I mean, their opposition came through taunting 
uh, you know, they made fun of him as they were trying to work and getting started. They uh, planned to attack and kill the workers, and so Nehemiah had to organize the people so that as they worked, they were protected. And, and then they, uh, they accused them of treason. They didn't know that Nehemiah was a friend of the king. <laughs> and they tried to assassinate Nehemiah only four times that are written in Scripture. And then they tried to frighten Nehemiah through the threat of assassination so that he would go and hide in the temple. And he just said, who do you think I am? I'm not going there. Number one, I'm not allowed to be in the temple in that part. And number two, I'm not afraid. So uh, now here's the report from when the wall was finished. So we talk about celebrating through opposition. So this is uh, Nehemiah chapter six. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month Elul in 52 days. And when all of our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. So no matter the victories we experience, uh, look, if you're just committed to following Jesus, you're going to face opposition. Okay, opposition is going to be part of life. The reality is people are going to slander you. They're going to accuse you of false motives. They're going to reject you, betray you, mock you. Uh, they're going to predict your failure. But if you remain faithful, you're going to succeed. If you endure, you're going to succeed. If you don't give up on Jesus, you're going to succeed. And here's the thing. And since we belong to Jesus. Now, wait a minute. Let's, let's make sure. Do you belong to Jesus? <laughs> okay, but that means that you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world. You believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Now, if you have done that, if you belong to Jesus, then understand this. Jesus won the victory. He promises us heaven, and we are on Team Jesus. Okay, because you're one of his. You're on his team. So we win. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, that's a little bit better. You know, there's a delayed reaction. Like, wait, I mean, you know, yeah. It's that, well, look, you guys will probably you know, react better than the other services. I didn't say that. Parker went nuts, I'm sure. Okay, so here's the thing. It, you know, that's kind of how we live our lives in Jesus a lot of times, is the reality is we know that we've won the victory, but we don't actually act like we've won the victory. Right? I mean, because we're like, hey, we're on Team Jesus. <laughs> okay. You know, you're going to heaven, and nothing can stop that. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, that's kind of a cool truth that ought to change our lives. But... Um, Every single day that we walk this earth, we can celebrate our victory in Christ, no matter the opposition we face. So Nehemiah and the people celebrated God's goodness. And by the way, Calvary is celebrating. Now, some of you are like, why are you celebrating? Because you still have dinners left, right? Did someone already donate the money and we don't have to show up? Uh, no, but that'd be nice. But anyway... Um, Look, we're, we're celebrating, and, and, and I'll just, I want you to hear this. Money and buildings are not the goal. Leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus is our purpose, okay? Uh, that, by the way, it's the next point, so it's a long one, so you might as well want to pop it up there so they can fill in all the blanks. But, uh, like, money and buildings aren't the goal. It, the, the, the whole reason we're having the dinners, the whole reason we're talking about limitless is not just about money and buildings, even though, you know, we need money to build buildings. But, uh, but I want you to understand, whether we raise a million dollars or $10 million, we are still going to be on mission for Jesus. The mission is not dependent upon the success of fundraising. Look, God can give us the money that we need. And, and, and so that's just a reality. And whatever God gives us, we will praise God for. Why? Because he's already given us the victory and he's given us enough. Okay, just understand uh, that, that that's my conviction. So I'm going to praise God whether we raise a little bit or whether we, we raise a bunch because love is patient, even if I'm not. <laughs> and, and, and that's reality. And God knows what he's doing, even, even when sometimes we go, what are you doing? And, and so, you know, it's, it, the mission is never dependent on dollars. The early church didn't have a budget. They didn't have any money. They didn't have any space. They didn't have any buildings. And what did they do? God used them to turn the world upside down. 
See, so it's not dependent on our money. See, we celebrate life change, and God is changing lives. So uh, since God is changing lives, and, and some of you are like, yeah, yeah, but uh, well, if you're having any questions about it, here's some more proof. Take a look at this. Three years ago, my life completely blew apart from my own doing. I went from having it all, beautiful family, and a beautiful life. So I thought, but that's when I hit rock bottom, by destroying my own marriage and my own family with my anger, my rage, and my pornography addiction. I hit rock bottom, so some things had to change. I came to Calvary again, but this time it was completely different. I gave my life to God. I started following His work. Every day, I started to serve more and more at this church. I have seen the life change that He's given me. I follow His word to help others down this path. I'm fully committed to being here with God and help others. I've been a full part of Celebrate Recovery and has changed my life. I have a relationship with my family again because of the grace and mercy of God and His redemption powers. He is turning my mess into one of His masterpieces. I want to invite you to this life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. What do you have to lose? Hello, my name is Sarah. I was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 14. I almost died a couple times. I grew up in a dysfunctional family where I rebelled against God and started using substance abuse to numb my pain. Then life changed when I surrendered to God three years ago. I started coming to church, attending CR, where I found an accountability. You can't hide in CR. I tried, it doesn't work. If you think you are a lost cause, you're wrong. Don't limit God's powerful mercy and grace. He offered it to me and He will give it to you if you ask Him. My name is Todd. It's a blessing to share a small piece of how Jesus changed my life. I grew up believing in God, but despising Him, believing He caused all bad things in this world as punishment. I carried this belief in adulthood, for I was overcome by my addictions after the loss of my daughter. I sought to escape through substance abuse and had reserved myself to suicide in 2020. God met me there even when I was unwilling to meet Him. He placed godly people in my life outside of the church to draw me in. The love and grace they had through Jesus bled over into my life and saved me from myself. I have now submitted myself to Christ and have a completely restored family, life, community, and most of all, a growing relationship with Jesus. If He can change my life, He can change yours too. Hi, my name is Stephanie. Two years ago, I found myself sitting in a prison cell with no one, no family, no friends, no one but my thoughts. I knew something had to change, and I knew I wanted to change. Upon my release from prison, I was welcomed into an amazing program called Faith and Grace. They welcomed me with open arms, and they gave me a place where I was loved, and I can heal, and I could fix myself. My advocate, Sarah, asked me if I was interested in coming to services here at Calvary. I'm proud to say that it's been five months and I come to the 11 o'clock service every day and I have not missed a service. I'm no longer addicted to drugs or alcohol. I'm no longer in a codependent relationship and I no longer look at myself as a failure. Through God's love and His unfailing devotion, I've been able to heal and put myself back together. I know if God can change my life, He can change yours too. And I welcome you all to come to Calvary and give it a shot. My name is Vic and I'm a grateful follower of Jesus Christ. I spent my entire life running from God. Now I spend my life running to Him. I live my life as an addict, addicted to methamphetamines, heroin, opiates, anything I can get my hands on. And uh, God showed me that there's so much more to life. And He came and He showed me His grace. He introduced me to His Son, Jesus Christ. And now I'm a grateful follower of Jesus and I run to Him instead of from Him. If He can do this for me, He can do this for anybody because I was, as Paul put it, the chief of sinners. But He still came into my life and showed me His grace. And for that, I'm forever thankful. It's in Jesus' name, we live. See, if you don't believe me, listen to them. Uh, we celebrate life change. And whatever we raise financially, hey, we're going to use that to continue the mission of life change. Because again, the mission is not dependent on dollars ever. It is the mission of Jesus, and it is dependent on God's limitless power. So we're going to celebrate life change. And, and by the way, in case you haven't figured it out yet, contagious celebration is one of our core values here at Calvary. Uh, following Jesus results in a joy-filled life that draws people to Jesus. That's what we want to see happen. That's why we celebrate life change. Now the question is, what are you celebrating? 
What are you celebrating? Or are you even celebrating at all? You see, have you experienced the presence and power of God, especially during these last few weeks of this campaign? I mean, has God answered any of your prayers? Has he restored any of your relationships? Or has he revealed himself to you during this time through reading and praying and fasting in a new way? See, what is it that you are celebrating in your life? And I ask you because of the admonition in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, because he says this. And again, I'm going to uh, just read this because I want you to hear this. Then he said, go your way, eat the fat, drink sweet wine, send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to the Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The power of God is connected to our joy in Jesus. Let me say that again. Do you, do you understand this? The power of God is connected to the joy that you have in your relationship with Jesus Christ. The ability to endure is connected to choosing to celebrate. The strength to fulfill God's purpose in your life is dependent upon our joy in the Lord. And, and to me, that's just an amazing truth. And, and it might also be why joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You see, whatever we are facing, no matter the challenge, no matter the betrayals, no matter the, the sorrow or the pain, we can rejoice in Jesus. He is our savior. He is our redeemer. He's our champion. He's our friend. He has forgiven our sins. He has adopted us into his family. He has given us the Holy Spirit and he has prepared a place for us in heaven. And because of that, we really can rejoice. Now we've already talked about, hey, you have this to celebrate, that cause to celebrate. So we can rejoice all the time. Now, the, the question then becomes, how do we live in the joy of the Lord? Because uh, let's be honest, there are grumpy Christians out there, okay? And maybe you know some of them. Maybe you are some of them. Uh, but there are grumpy Christians out there. And, and you know, I, look, my experience was growing up in the church that when, whenever they talked about joy, I didn't understand it because nobody was living it around me. And in fact, if you were living it too much, people looked at you a little like skeptical, like what's wrong with them? Uh, you know, they're just uh, faking it or something. So how do we actually live in the joy of the Lord? How do we experience God's strength in our lives? And, and I'm just gonna give you three choices. Three choices that I want to encourage you to make every single day. And as you make these choices, I believe you're going to increase God's joy because you're going to be obedient to him and you're going to be inviting his joy into your life, okay? So here they are, three choices. First one is choose gratitude instead of grumbling. Choose gratitude instead of grumbling. You know, Philippians 2.14, the apostle Paul says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Do all things without grumbling or or disputing. Now, I know as a youth pastor, I used to go, this is parents' favorite verse, right? Because they just want to say to their kids, do all things without, you know, grumbling or disputing. Grumbling or arguing is how I heard it. Uh, complaining or arguing is another way of doing it. So, you know, do all things like that. All the parents are like underlining that one going, I want to put that in my kids, you know, rooms. I want to paint it on their walls. Uh, but here's the thing. We're the ones who complain about everything. We're the ones who grumble. Right? We don't get our way. They, you know, whether it's uh, at the restaurant because they mess up your order or whether it's the drivers on the road or whether it's the weather or whether it's, you know, the, you know, there's just so many things that we grumble about and you can't rejoice when you're complaining and you can't complain when you're rejoicing. Okay, this is just a reality. And so your life is going to lean one way or the other. So can I just encourage you to choose to see and acknowledge your blessings and your heart will be glad. Besides, it's God's will for you. Because in 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul said, be joyful always, pray continually, and in everything give thanks for this is God's will for you who are in Christ Jesus. Most of you have already said we're in Christ Jesus. So if you're in Christ Jesus, why don't you go ahead and rejoice always? Pray continually and in everything give thanks. So first of all, choose gratitude instead of grumbling and then choose encouragement instead of critique. Encouragement instead of critique. Um, 
Again, 1 Thessalonians 5, the, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Encourage one another, build one another up. Uh, Hebrews 10, the writer says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Isn't that a great goal? Hey, how can I stir other people up to love and good works? As opposed to, how can I critique them or discourage them and drag them down so that I feel better about myself than they do? You see, it is so easy and tempting to be the critic, right? To be the one who's always full of snark, to be the one who always points out the, uh, you know, problem, to be the one who points out everybody's flaws and everybody's failures and, and just go, hey, uh, that's all wrong. But, but the problem with that is if you do that, then you only discourage people. And I know some of you are like, but, but they need to improve and I'm God's gift to them to help them improve. <laughs> I promise you they don't see you as God's gift, okay? They might see you as the tormentor in the flesh, but they don't see you as God's gift. And, and look, I, I'm just gonna say this. Every one of us can improve. Every one of us can improve in almost every way, okay? And by the way, I've already made this clear. We're all sinners. We're all failures. Uh, that, that's just part of life. So yes, we want to improve. And, and I'm the first one to tell you, if you're just stuck in the same place complaining about the same things, uh, I'm going to encourage you to change. And then I'm going to walk away because I don't want you to drag me down either. All right. So, uh, you know, but, but at the same time, there is a choice. Are you going to encourage or are you going to criticize? Because you can't do both. All right. And, and, and this is one of those principles that, that I think, uh, I hope will resonate in your mind. Uh, relationship needs to precede rebuke. And if you want to help someone get better, you need to have enough of a relationship with them where they will invite your uh, wisdom into their life. You know what happens with most critics? Nobody invites their wisdom into their life because it's not wisdom. It's just critique. It's just complaints about how you don't measure up and how you're not good enough. You know, and, and the tragic thing is, some of us learn that from our parents and we're passing it down to our kids. And yet it's not biblical. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. So instead of discouraging people, instead of critiquing everyone, why don't you choose to build up? Why don't you choose to catch people doing something good and celebrate that? Why don't you choose to bless? You know, every time you open your mouth, you're either going to bless or you're going to curse. Why don't you just choose to bless? Your words can, can bless people, so let your words do that. Decide to be an encourager. And, and, and for some of you, you're like, oh, but I'm just made this way. No, yes, it's life change we're talking about. Like, I know all the arguments. I've heard them. Because when I try to encourage people, well, I'm just, God gave me that gift. No, that is not God's gift. Because <laughs> I don't think he'd give you a gift and then tell you not to use it. That's exactly what he's telling, telling us. So, um, look, this is, a, this is a point of life change. And, and if you think, well, I can't overcome that, then there's this program for you on Monday nights at 6.30 called Celebrate Recovery. <laughs> because they will help you overcome that. See, you're not stuck. You don't have to be stuck. And, and you can repent and choose encouragement instead of critique. Um, you see, after all, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And if you want God's power in your life, then uh, choose to encourage. And then the third choice I want to challenge you with is choose contentment instead of discontent. Choose contentment instead of discontent. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, the Apostle Paul says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Uh, in, in Philippians 4, that fav favorite passage of so many people, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You guys know that one? Yes. Do you know that, that context of that is contentment? That the Apostle Paul is saying, I've learned I can, I can live with abundance and I can live with lack. It doesn't matter if things are good or bad, if I'm in need or have, you know, uh, enough. He says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You read the whole passage and, and he's celebrating contentment in that. And, and this is hard for us. We inhabit a culture that is immersed. And when I, and, and you would talk about immersed, we're talking about baptized. Okay, that's the word for baptized. Uh, 
we, we, we inhabit a culture that is baptized into being discontent. Right? That's how they sell us stuff. Because all the commercials, all the advertisement is telling you, you don't have enough. You need more. You need new. You need this. You don't have this, you're a loser. All the winners have this. You need to have this too. And so we become unhappy with what we have, even though what we have is more than about 80 to 90% of the world. It's just not more than our neighbor. So we're discontent. And we have become, as a society, addicted to more. We got to have more. We need more food. We need more money. We need more toys. We need more houses. We need more stuff. I hate to say this, but I think as a culture, we've become more whores. We will sell out everything for more when we, do, when we already have plenty. And, 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 it, and God's power is not resting in our lives because we're living in discontentment. And see, when we choose contentment, we're recognizing God's provision and are grateful for what God has given us. I mean, God's never opposed to us improving our lives, but he doesn't want us to be driven by accumulating and accomplishing more, 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 more. And and when we are content with our lives, we just serve God and we try to accomplish his missions and we thank God for what we have. So are you celebrating? What are you celebrating? Yeah. One person, we're good. Look, the joy of the Lord is our strength. I mean, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And, and we're, we've got to either choose to be people of joy or live without the power of God resonating in our lives. Now, I choose to live in joy. And I am begging you to join me. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, it, it is amazing that in our sinful, wretched states, you not only love us, but you have put your Holy Spirit in our lives and he is committed to teaching us joy so that we can celebrate your goodness and grace that is undeserved, so that we can celebrate your, your love and mercy that is with us forever, so that we can celebrate your presence and your peace that passes understanding. God, we can celebrate uh, the reality that no matter how bad this world is, you have promised us a place where there's no more suffering or sorrow or dying or pain. Uh, and Lord, until we get there, we wanna celebrate you because you have given us hope and a purpose. And, and Lord, that purpose is life change. And we celebrate because you've changed our lives and we celebrate as a church every time you change one more life. So right now, we simply want to surrender to you because we're not the sons and daughters that you want us to be, that you call us to be, but we want to. So meet us right now, meet us in this room, and we surrender to you in Jesus' name, amen. If you've been following along during Limitless, you'll be aware of the capital campaign that accompanies the series. We have a need to expand our ministry capacity at our campus in Lake Havasu City. If during this time the Lord has impressed upon you to support the ministry of Calvary, you can do so on our website at calvaryaz.com forward slash give. We are extremely excited about the future of our church community and that people are experiencing a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, that'll do it for today. Please join us next week when we launch the journey to Easter. Bye-bye. Are you looking for a way to dive deeper into scripture and make it a part of your daily routine? Check out Calvary's Word for the Day daily devotional videos. Visit calvaryaz.com forward slash D-E-V-O and sign up to receive these three to five minute devotionals right to your inbox each day. Our team of pastors and leaders share meaningful insights from the Bible to equip and encourage you in your faith journey. Don't miss out on this opportunity to grow in your relationship with God and connect with the community of believers. Sign up today and start receiving your daily dose of scripture.